see that it is I indeed, my hands and feet. And they would have looked. And then he insists, touch me, touch me and see for yourselves. See, last Sunday, it was Thomas who said, I won't believe unless I can put my finger into the holes the nails made, and unless I can put my hand into his side. I refuse to believe. Of course, Thomas's uh, wound was his doubting. Of course, the others had all their own wounds. Their faith had been shattered. But he invites them now all to touch him. To touch him. So, of course, last Sunday was... Thomas wasn't with them on this occasion. That was already eight, eight days later for Thomas, and that's why the church gives us that gospel. They gave us that gospel last Sunday. But today, it's still Easter day. And, and so he, they, he invites them to touch me, touch me. And there's something important about this because he wants them to recognize that his body is truly risen from the dead, the same body that had been crucified. It became fashionable towards the early last century, in fact, even middle or, or later, um, so in the 1980s, 70s, 80s, but after a German uh, biblical theologian, and uh, Vrede was his uh, surname, that in fact, Jesus' body wasn't really the same body that was crucified. And so the theory was postulated that, you know, if we, if archaeologists found a body today in, that was killed in first century Palestine that had nails, wounds of nails in his hands and feet, and, uh, you know, it's probably discovered as the body of Jesus, that wouldn't really change our faith at all. And what would you say to that? Would that change your faith at all? It would change my faith. It means Jesus is, was, didn't really rise from the dead. That basically it's like a, a resurrection in the memory of, Mo, of, of uh, Elvis or something, you know. Elvis lives. He didn't really die. You know, it's, I mean, I'm saying that as a, as a joke, obviously, but it wouldn't mean anything. The resurrection of Jesus would have meant nothing. It would have been just a reawakening of, his, of the memory. And yet these apostles, eventually, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, are willing to die for Him. Die for Him. They didn't become sophisticated, they were uneducated, and they were still largely uneducated, except for Matthew. But their courage, their conviction, they're standing up now to the chief priests, they're able to defend what they had seen. And so Jesus wants to instill in them, in his eye, it's the same body, look at me. I've got the wound marks, I've got the battle wounds, I've been to the war, I've fought, I've died, and I've risen again. It's important for us to reflect a little bit at this stage while we're reflecting on touching Jesus, because Jesus invites us to touch him. Jesus invites us to touch him, not in a physical sense, but he invites us to enter into a relationship. And to touch someone means we need to walk towards them. I mean, they can walk towards us as well. But we're walking towards them and reaching out, which they would have done. And as they touched him and saw that he was solid, they would have also realized, wow, I, I can't believe this. They were gobsmacked. And then they would have watched him eating this piece of grilled fish. And I imagine there would have been a lot of silence there. And they just still can't believe. And yet they're seeing the fish, which would have taken perhaps a few minutes to eat a piece of grilled fish. Maybe our Lord made a comment, you know, who cooked this one? You know, it's a bit overdone or something like that. Or maybe it's well done. I don't know. Who caught this fish? But it would have been, that's the sort of thing that I imagine would have happened. And it's all to help them in a sensory way come to that conviction that Jesus is truly risen from the dead. But I want to spend a few moments reflecting on the properties of this glorified body. Because, yes, it is the same body that had been crucified. But it's also a body that now responds differently. The, the glorified body, and this, by the way, is what Christ holds out for each one of us if we remain faithful to him until death. That we will be raised up again on the last day and receive our own bodies back glorified. So we'll still be the same body, but it will be glorified. 
we are not subject to the limitations, and we won't be subject to the limitations of this world of space and time. What are some of the limitations of this world of space and time? Aging, illness. Aging, illness. Great. What else? I always keep falling down. I never hit the ceiling when I. Yes. Yet we've got to eat and drink or else we die. Notice Jesus can still eat and drink, but he doesn't have to. What else is there? We're born, we live, and we die. and we die. No more dying. No more dying. Right? We can't get sick. Can we get injured? No. No, not in the glorified body. We can. Yes, we can. But in the glorified body, we can no longer suffer. We receive what's called the gift of impassibility. It's the gift that Adam and Eve had before they sinned, the original sin, whatever that was. And they, they lost that ability to not be able to suffer. So now we, we do suffer. We get sick and eventually we will die. So they also lost the gift of immortality. Mind you, had Adam and Eve gone, you know, jumped off a cliff, they would have certainly died, right? Or gone to an active volcano, they would have died. But these were what we call the preternatural gifts. I'll talk about those another time. There were four of them. But we also know that this glorified body is not subject to gravity. And St. John, when he talks about the resurrection, he says twice, not once, the doors were closed, but Jesus came in and stood among them. Why on earth is he saying that twice if he's not trying to make a statement? The doors were closed for fear of the Jews, but Jesus came and stood among them. Solid walls or doors provide no obstacle for the glorified body. We can pass through them. We'll be able to pass through. And course there's a you know physicists can have their own explanation about this but this is what we see from the scriptures there's also something else that happens and is a property of a glorified body namely the gift of agility so when we get up in the morning are we always full of energy maybe if you're young yeah, we're not full of energy right so this morning I didn't feel like getting up but the, the reality is, if we want to go to somewhere, I mean, want to go to Sydney, we're going to get there, ride a bicycle, or catch a train, or drive a car, right? If you're crazy, you might want to walk, but the, it'll, it's going to take time. The gift of agility means you simply choose to be somewhere, and you will be there. I want to be in South Africa, and I would be there. I would have the complete power over my body that's totally under the soul and I'd be able to do to go there. The gift of agility is an incredible gift. It's instantaneous. You see, I'd be able to go anywhere. I'd, I'd be able to explore the new heavens and the new earth, however they will look. I mean, God has made this amazing universe and most of it, most of it, most of it, we cannot explore because we just simply cannot travel fast enough. I mean, even the light of the sun that's shining outside now is eight minutes old. Eight minutes old. The light of the stars that we see at night is millions of years old, hundreds of millions of years old. And, of course, depending how far back we go. So, you see, the gift of agility, we could go anywhere. We could do anything. We could know all things through what we call the beatific vision. Because at that moment, our minds are conformed to the mind of God. And our capacity to drink of God's glory will depend on the good works and the acts of love that we have done in this life. Acts of merit, we call them. So according to our merit, that decides or determines the cup that we will have in eternity. St. Therese of Lisieux. A, who only died at the age of 24, was explaining this to one of her sisters. And she got a whole lot of different glasses there, you know, so big cups and little cups and so forth. And, and so she filled them all up with water. And she asked 
her sister, is one of the cups more full than the other? She says, no, no. But all of them are filled to capacity. And that's how it will be in heaven. Some of us will have bigger cups, some of us lesser cups. But we will all be saturated in the knowledge of God. And we will know and be aware of each other that there's a, a different cup. Our Lady's cup is extraordinary. This perfect vessel, the great saints that have existed in Christian history, extraordinary capacity to receive and drink of God's knowledge. So, you know, we may not end up that great, but certainly not as great as Our Lady, but our cup will be full. These are all the properties of the glorified body, and we will have this amazing experience. We will never be sad. We will always be filled with joy. So Jesus wants to convince them of this, and he goes to a great extent to do it. But then he goes to explain what the scriptures were saying about him, right? He wants them to know from the law of Moses, from the prophets, and from the Psalms. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Typically, a Jew, when they're arguing about a particular point of faith, like the, the scribes and the, and the doctors of, um, of the people, the rabbis, they would argue from the law of Moses, and then go from the prophets, and then the Psalms. The Samaritans, who were the poorer cousin, basically thought and considered only the law of Moses. The first five books <coughs> excuse me, of the Old Testament were the revelation. The prophets, and when we talk about the prophets for the Jewish mind, we're talking, or the Hebrew mind, we're talking Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the three major prophets. They're the biggest. Then the other, what we call the minor prophets, are, you know, so Haggai, Jonah, Amos, Obadiah. Okay, these are part of what we know as the writings, the writings. And then the Psalms, the Psalms, well, you might recall from the Passion of St. John that Jesus at the Last Supper, they sang Psalms and they crossed the Kedron Valley. The Psalms they would have sung were Psalms 112 to 118. There was these six Psalms you would sing after dinner in praise and worship. By the way, how many Psalms are there? Want to have a shot? Sister, you can't answer. You know the answer to this question. Go on, yes. 150. 150. Okay? And that's why, for instance, the rosary used to have three mysteries in it. Each mystery had 50 Hail Marys. Because when the religious movement started in the church, the lay people who would have liked to imitate the example of the religious, but they, they couldn't, many couldn't read or write, and so they can't pray the Psalms. And so they thought, right, we'll pray the Hail Marys. 50 Hail Marys times three, joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries. And that's why the 150 Hail Marys are there, for, to mimic and mirror the 150 Psalms. Of course, St. John Paul II introduced a new set of mysteries, the mysteries of light. So it kind of throws that um, numbering out, but it's worthwhile to know the history of it. Now, the Psalms are actually into five major books. One, book one is 1 to 42, and then 43 to 72, and then Psalm 73 to 89, 90 to 106, and then 107 to 150. And these Psalms reflect the first book, the life of David, second book, David and his son Solomon, third book, the divided kingdom, which took place after about 960 BC to about the 587 BC, so the divided kingdom up till the point of the, the Babylonian deportation, and then Book 4, the Babylonian deportation, it's a short period, so 90, Psalm 90 to Psalm 106, reflect this. And then we've got book, uh, book 5, which is their return to Judea. And we've got Psalms in there like um, with that song, By the rivers of Babylon, 
there we sat down, you know, by the river, okay, I forget who was saying it, but it was in Bonnier. Bonnier, okay, thank you. I was in, in the 70s, and uh, anyway, but it was a reflection of the people back in their time of captivity. Jesus wants them to join the dots. Why? So they will be able to explain to others that the Messiah truly came, that the scriptures were fulfilled, and that, in fact, God keeps his promises. But notice then, and later on, he says, and he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Is it possible to read the Bible and totally misunderstand what it's about? Absolutely. Does anyone think it's not possible? Okay, I'm glad we agree on that because it's, it's, it's astonishing. You know, you, you see so many different groups who claim to be Christian and yet when they come to read the scriptures, particularly the book of the Apocalypse and the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, that extraordinary the interpretations they give, often because they don't know the original languages or they don't go through the history of how it was written. So it is possible to misunderstand the scripture and we need the grace of God. But a lesson for us to take into account here is, firstly, do we read the scripture every day? I mean, God only wrote one book. It's made of 73 little parts, but one book. And he's going to ask us, I wrote my book through human beings, but I wrote one book. Did you read it? Did you read it? How familiar are you with the book, the Word of God? And that doesn't mean we have to have a theology degree. That means each day we sit down and we read. 15 minutes, a half an hour, whatever you can. A chapter of the Gospels, a chapter of St. Paul's letters, whatever it is. But it's amazing how much you can read, even if you read the readings for the Mass for that day. You will, in three years, you will learn, if you read every day, you'll read the entire, virtually the entire Bible in three years. The Sunday readings and the weekday readings. You'll cover virtually the entire Bible. So you can read the scriptures and we can become familiar. But to ask Christ to enlighten us, help me Lord Jesus, grant me the gift of the Holy Spirit so that I will know what you are saying to me here. And what I mean is, I've read various passages, dozens and dozens, probably hundreds of times in my life. And, and they never cease to amaze me how rich they are. Now, okay, it's an advantage to have a knowledge of the original languages, but even so, just rereading it and seeing it and letting the Holy Spirit speak to me. Something I might be going through that in, in life at that moment. Whatever, something that happened recently and the words jump out and they're words of consolation. They're words that bring me comfort and help me to realize they challenge me. Are you really doing this? When I read the seven letters from the book of the Apocalypse, I realize, wow, I can easily slot myself into some of those letters, the criticism that Jesus gives. So the importance of having an open mind. But then finally, this is all about enabling us to be able to bear witness. Are we going to bear witness to the reality of the risen Christ if we haven't touched him, figuratively speaking? Yes or no? No. No. We're not going to be convinced. Someone says, oh, I don't believe Jesus is real at all. Look at this, look at that, look at that, 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 that. All the bombardment of, of lies and hypocrisy and everything else. We need to have touched him. And so ask the Lord to reveal himself to you. Ask him to reveal himself as real in your life and beg him to show this. Secondly, to make an effort, if you haven't already done so or are not already doing so, to read some scripture every day. Every day. Doesn't have to be much, but just to read with attention. Get a good Bible, not the good news, please. Just, you know, but a, either the Jerusalem Bible, which is what we're reading from the scriptures, the New Jerusalem Bible, the New American Bible, the Revised Standard Version, Catholic edition, right? The New Revised Standard Version. These are good editions of the scriptures. 
make sure there are 73 little books in there because that's the complete Bible. But it's about being able to bear witness to Christ. When St. Peter defends our Lord in the first reading that we heard, he's full of courage, full of gusto. But why? Because he had met him. He had joined the dots in the scriptures and so he could stand and defend his position. We will only be able to bear witness if we are confident in our position. Which doesn't mean we've got to have theology degrees. We don't. But it does mean we have to know our faith. We have to know our story. Recently I went to a, a, a wake for a, a funeral. I always try to go to the wakes if I can at all uh, do so. Anyway, it was a family who hadn't uh, been very practicing in their faith. And uh, some of them, I think, many years. But I was just sitting there having something to eat, having a beer with some of the others. And one of the other people across the table said, Wow, I've never seen a, beer, a priest drinking a beer before. I said, well, guess what? I also sleep in a normal bed, and I sleep horizontally as well. Um, but you see, why do stereotypes develop like that? Um, I mean, it's because, obviously, the Christians that they're running into, and they would be running into Christians, are no longer shedding the light. No longer shedding the light. And the harvest is rich, my brothers and sisters. The harvest, everywhere around us we go, is rich for us to bear witness to the risen Christ in whatever way it seems appropriate to us then at that moment. So as we are reassured in our faith now, let us remember our Lord seeks us out and invites us to touch Him, to know that He is real. Secondly, He invites us to learn about Him in the Scriptures. So, and, and thirdly, that He is ready to open our minds to understand Him so that we will be ready to witness to him when the chance comes.